Welcome to the special Halloween episode of Shakespeare's Happy Hour. Cocktails and mocktails with the Bard. Your go-to source for spooky, bloody, terrifying, Shakespeare-centered cocktail conversation, drinks, games, guests, and to get us started, a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting chorus. Interrupting chorus. Oh, for a muse of fire. You just got a nerd joke from father-daughter duo Andrew and Lyda Carlson. As it's Halloween, we thought we would use the play Macbeth, Shakespeare's most terrifying and bloody play, as the inspiration for this week's cocktail and conversation. So here we go. <laughs> How much scotch have I had? Like two sips. Cheers to the deadly sin. The name of this week's mocktail and cocktail is Damned Spot and comes from Lady Macbeth's famous sleepwalking scene where she's endlessly trying to wash Duncan's blood from her hand. But you don't need to be a sleep-deprived, guilt-ridden murderer to enjoy this beautiful cocktail. Here's what you need. Two ounces of scotch. For the mocktail, substitute one half ounce vanilla plus one and one half ounce water. The thing that I love about the vanilla substitution is that it isn't trying to imitate alcohol, it's its own thing. Just make sure that your vanilla extract is alcohol free. One half ounce fino sherry. For the mocktail, substitute one half ounce apple cider vinegar. One ounce blood orange juice. Two dashes of blood orange non-alcoholic bitters. One half ounce simple syrup. No. One half ounce beet juice. We're going to combine all of the ingredients except the beet juice into our cocktail shaker with some ice and shake to combine. Now we're using Islay scotch, which is distilled on the island of Islay, one of the southernmost Hebrides, where they have been distilling whiskey since the early 1300s. I personally think that an even better choice would be Tomatin scotch. And Tomatin is distilled just 25 miles from Inverness, Macbeth's castle in Shakespeare's play. That's awesome. Yeah. Half ounce of sherry. Sherry would have been called sack, and it was hugely popular during Shakespeare's time. Shakespeare's character Falstaff was a huge fan <laughs> of sack. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack. It's just horrible advice. <laughs> Please don't addict your children to sack. Half an ounce of simple syrup. Mm. One ounce of blood orange juice. Two dashes of blood orange bitters. Ooh. Shakespeare mentions orange, both the color and the fruit, in several plays, though not Macbeth. However, these ingredients give our drink some freshness and complexity, and their bloody name ties in perfectly with our drink. Blood orange. Shake. <laughs> Strain into chilled glasses or pour over ice. Oh, it's beautiful. Now you top with the beet juice to give it that beautiful bloody color. Oh, so pretty. Look at that. Cheers. Oh, that is good. That beautiful beet juice is really what gives this drink that blood red color that makes it Lady Macbeth's damned spot. In fact, the word blood appears over 40 times in Macbeth. Shakespeare's repetition of the word stresses to the audience the full horror of Macbeth's murder of a king. This was especially true for the play's original audiences. For them, the killing of a king was not only a crime, but also a deadly sin. Now, this deadly sin that Shakespeare is referring to in the course of Macbeth is not just any deadly sin and not just any regicide, but a specific moment in 1605 on the 5th of November. That was the date that James I learned about the gunpowder plot, which was a failed attempt to blow up King James and the Parliament. The plot was organized by Robert Catesby in an effort to end the persecution of the Roman Catholics by the English government. At midnight on November 4th, 1605, one of the conspirators, Guy Fox, was discovered in the cellar of the Parliament building with numerous barrels of gunpowder, a lantern, and a fuse. Now, it's speculated that the amount of gunpowder used by Guy Fox and his co-conspirators would not have only blown up Parliament, mm -hmm. but about a four-block radius 
<laughs> they weren't messing around. No, there's a lot of gunpowder. Gunpowder, at the time, was considered by many to be alchemy, and therefore a kind of witchcraft. James I was famously obsessed with witchcraft. He even wrote a book about it called Demonology, written in 1599. Demonology uses terms like fair is foul and foul is fair. That's taken directly from the book. In the years following, many gunpowder plot plays were written. Plays like The Devil's Charter by Barnaby Barnes and The Whore of Babylon by Thomas Decker. They were essentially a genre play. A lot of people wrote them. This was sort of like a Western or an action film. All of these plays were pretty much melodramatic polemics about evil Catholic conspiracies, but Shakespeare, by contrast, did something with Macbeth which I think is pretty remarkable. He made Macbeth pretty much like you and I. Someone that uh, is an honorable person, but then is tempted by evil and falls deeper and deeper into this pit of evil deeds. What makes Macbeth so utterly terrifying is, is not the, the, the evil that someone else is doing, but the fact that Shakespeare points at us and says, if you're not careful, you will become the evil. And that is truly terrifying. Cheers. Now I get to introduce our guest. GRSF audiences will remember our guests from his dynamic performances in Richard III, Cymbeline, and his heroic Malcolm in the 2019 production of Macbeth. <laughs> How much scotch have I had? <laughs> like two sips. <laughs> from Brooklyn, New York, please welcome everybody, my friend Alex Given. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey Alex, welcome! <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> it's good to be seen by you. Alex Givens, we are delighted you are here to play our Shakespeare quiz for a chance to win a Shakespeare's Happy Hour coaster for one of our donors, plus a new bonus gift. Which we will reveal at the end of the episode. Today, you will be playing for Charlotte Spelts of Apex, North Carolina. Answer two out of three questions correctly, and Charlotte will be a winner. Alex, are you ready to play? I think I am. Let's go. All right, Alex, here we go. How many kings reign during the course of the play Macbeth. Oh my gosh, it was me. It was Malcolm. Malcolm was the third king to be crowned at the end of the play. So the three kings are King Duncan, Macbeth, and Malcolm. That is correct. correct. <laughs> One down. All right, next question. Shakespeare's Malcolm was based on the real life Scottish king, Malcolm I, Malcolm II, or Malcolm III. How's your knowledge of ancient Scottish history? Oh gosh. Good luck. I'm gonna go with Malcolm the Second. No, I'm sorry, I'm afraid it was Malcolm the Third. That was a tough one, but there's still hope. You're still in it, Alex, you're still in it. Last question. Who does Lady Macbeth frame for the murder of Duncan? Who does Lady Macbeth frame for the murder of Duncan? She frames the guards outside of King Duncan's chambers. Yes. 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 Bravo! Alex Gibbons, you have won. For Charlotte Speltz of Apex, North Carolina, she will get this coaster and a bonus prize. Thank you so much, guys. It's Alex Gibbons, everybody. So Chris, tell us more about this bonus prize you were teasing earlier. I am so excited about the bonus prize. Listen, the folks over at Make and Muddle who make mixers for cocktails and mocktails have chosen to support us and help us out and send over the bonus gift to our winner this week. A gift pack with their seven syrup, two pepper agave, and honey lavender elixir. That sounds delicious. <laughs> yes, doesn't it? We thank Make and Muddle so much for supporting the arts. Thank you, Make and Muddle. Cheers, and thank you all for joining us for Shakespeare's Happy Hour. We'll see you next time. See you soon. Bye. Mm. Mm. You can really taste the evil. <laughs>